I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their favourite things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain a genuine insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Lane Beachley is one of the most remarkable athletes Australia has ever produced. She's a genuine star on the global stage, winning no fewer than a record seven world surfing championships. I first met Lane four years ago. We were in the ocean, but we didn't have surfboards. In fact, we didn't have swimmers either, as we were both doing the Sydney Skinny at the time. So, Lane, I have to ask, what did you find more challenging, getting naked for the Sydney Skinny or choosing your items for the five of my life? Seeing you naked, Nigel. <laughs> that was the most challenging thing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you didn't get your gear off that particular day. You made all of us get our gear off in front of you. I, 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 I did swim. And then us into the ocean. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, oh, there's Nigel in the water. You just waited for all of us to get out. It's all out a big scam. Shot. It is a total scam. <laughs> all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> Fortunately, it's very good for those exhibitionists down there at uh, Cobbler's Beach. But it's a great program and, and it's, uh, it's a real liberating experience to get out of your own way and embrace the skin you're in and go and dive in the water and swim with hundreds of, if not thousands of strangers. Well, you're a dead set legend to have done it. So, so on to your choices. Did you find the process challenging or, or, or easy? There were certain, certain answers that I found incredibly easy and then there was a couple of choices such as the possession, for example. Right. Really, Don't tell us what it is yet, but you no, found that really but hard. I found that really challenging because I said to my husband, if this house was burning down, what would be the three main possessions you'd run out of here with? And uh, he didn't actually pick me. <laughs> well, no, hey, hey, me too. That's good. You're not a possession. You're <laughs> not a number, Lane. That's true, You're that's a, true. a real life human being. Very good positive spin, there, Nigel. I like it. He did pick his computer, his phone, and his passport. I'm like, mm, no, they're not real valuable positions. <laughs> so this is great. So, so you were you were getting him to do it as well? Well, just certain things. Yeah, yeah certain aspects, just to give me some inspiration. But, so, so, um, so what I found that that's what, which is which is quite fun, is people yeah. say, oh, I was I was thinking about mine and then mm. I end up talking to my mum or my girlfriend or my husband or whatever and so mm. yeah yeah so we're going to get into we're going to start with your film now, oh yes now you've chosen the second Austin Powers film the, the spy that shagged me it's very shagadelic I, 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 the rumour is that they're going to make a fourth one and it's oh. called uh, For Your Thighs Only <laughs> <laughs> isn't that great that's gold <laughs> so, so before you, you tell us uh, why you chose it mm. uh, tell, tell me what you like about the film or, or what you don't like about the film why did I choose The Spy Who Shagged Me? Well, do I make you randy, baby? Do I? <laughs> I, I love the, the humour. I love the characters. And one of my favourite characters in that film was Fat Bastard. Yep. And um, I happened to watch that film, I think, seven times. Wow. To the point where I could recite the film from beginning to end. All the different characters, <laughs> all the different lines. Is it Heather Graham? Yes. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Felicity yeah. Shagwell. Yeah. <laughs> Shagwell by name, shag very well by reputation, baby. <laughs> and then there's someone in it with my maiden name. It's awful. My, my apologies. Uh, my maiden name was Spit. My married name is Swallow or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then he does that look to camera. Yeah, yeah baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's just, there was a whole lot of um, hilarious moments in that film. but And also why I chose it was because I think I actually, no, I was thinking it, that was the, the movie that I went on my second date with my husband, but it was the third Austin Powers film that I went on my ah. second date. 
Okay. With my husband, my future husband, but now husband. Um, so, but yeah. So this, this was 90. This, this was is 1999. So you were on your, your second was world. Competing for my second world title, which happened to be my most challenging world title. And, and, and why was that? Well, as you'll see with a lot of athletes or teams who are attempting to repeat success, there seems to be this insurmountable amount of expectation and pressure on our shoulders. And no one's responsible more than ourselves yeah. for when we start to take that on. And, and I just took that on as being, okay, now I'm number one in the world. All of a sudden I have to be twice as good as what I was six months ago to repeat that success and deserve that success. I won six in a row and then had two years where I missed it because for a variety of reasons, one, great competition, two, severe injuries, and then came back and won my seventh one in 2006. Bloody good on you. I was 34 years old. (laughs) <laughs> competing against girls that weren't even born when I started touring. <laughs> <laughs> Disrespectful little things they can do. Yeah. W- what part of the world was the second world championship in? Well, it's a points accumulation, so I was competing ah, all so, over so the world. So you do, you add it up over. You, started you, you, in You can tell I know fuck all about surfing, don't you? <laughs> That's obvious. It's rather insulting. I can't believe, you know, you, you show me these notes and you pretend you've been reading all about me. I know lots about you, but not me, about but surfing. <laughs> not about my career, obviously. <laughs> so let me fill you in. Yeah. I won my first world title in 1998. My second one, 99. Third one, two and on we went uh, but uh, yeah I remember when that first Austin Powers film came out I didn't quite get it yeah because I, I was very serious a very serious focused determined athlete sure and had the compassion of a tiger shark for myself and others yeah and so when the second one came out I got it mm. you know I watched the first one a couple of times went okay now I get it it's actually just satire yep. and it's supposed to be funny and then when the second came out, one came out I just loved fat bastard and dr evil and mini me and yep. uh, and just the way that Mike Myers creates these characters based on his own personal experiences with family yeah was it's, it's just hilarious so I just loved it and fell in love with it and that's why I had to watch it so often it's got a sensation soundtrack as well it does actually and, and it's got it's got any um uh cameos from from really mm. brilliant musical it's got elvis costello yes. and uh willie nelson and burt baccarat yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so that was in 1999 yeah um the book that you've chosen was well uh, actually i didn't tell you why i chose the film Oh, well then, please, crack ahead. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you're running this program? Or yes. You no, no, you to... take over, Lane. It's yours. Do it. <laughs> Do it. The reason I chose this film was because it helped me win my second world title. Tell me more. Well, as I was saying, that insurmountable amount of pressure and expectation I was experiencing led to me pushing myself too hard. And that resulted in a severe knee injury during or right in the lead up to the US Open, which is about the fifth event of right. the year. And I had started to lose my sense of um, connection with the world title because I was having really inconsistent results, which is ultimately a a result of inconsistent mindset Mm -hmm. and thought processes. And then what happened was I was in free surfing down at Trestles one afternoon and I did a manoeuvre that pushed me too far and I tore my medial ligament in my right knee. Mm. And so I was pretty much out for the next couple of events. I was supposed to stay out for six weeks. I stayed out for 10 days and then surfed in the US Open, didn't perform that well, but then went over to the UK, Yep. And which you're familiar with. Mm-hmm. And I went and surfed at a place called Newquay. Yes. And in Not the, Fistral Beach. No, yes, Fistral Beach yep. and cold and small, standard. And so in between every heat, I would come in and put ice and a TENS machine on my knee and I'd have my foot elevated, did the whole rice thing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) rest, ice, compression, elevation, and just managed to progress my way through heat after heat after heat. And I was surfing with a big um, carbon kind of knee brace on as well. So it was a real challenging time but it was the at the time it was the richest event in the world and it was offering twenty thousand dollars u.s prize money for number for first place which is almost half of what i would earn in a year anyway (laughs) so i was going after it and i also needed this result to propel me back into first place on the tour ranking so i could defend my world title so i made the final and i could see we had been at the beach since seven o'clock that morning and the final due to summer and the sun being high uh, the final didn't surf till about five or six, maybe even seven o'clock that night. So we'd been at the beach all day. And I remember walking down to the final, I looked at my competitor and her eyes were bulging out of her head. She was exhausted, as was I. Mm-hmm. But I also got this hint that she had her eyes on the prize. She had her eyes on getting that money. And so I used the words of fat bastard <laughs> to distract me from thinking about winning 
to make sure that I stayed focused on the processes that I needed right. to follow to perform at my best because when I perform at my best, I'm going to win. Yeah. And so I remember paddling around on the water looking at her and just going, you can keep your money. I want your baby. <laughs> I want my baby back, baby back, baby back, baby back. Ribs, chillies, baby back ribs. And so I just started reciting Fat right. Bastard to distract me from the fact that I'm competing for a final and, and a win and 20,000 US, but I want the win. In, I don't want the prize money. Yeah. Um, and so it was just a really healthy distraction to keep me. That's a sensational story. I went on and won. And the thing was in the UK, they actually had to go and raid all the banks to get the cash, to pay me in cash. And they paid me $3,000 in $1 bills. <laughs> so I had this wad of cash that I ended up traveling through rich. Europe with. I felt loaded. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I had to just kind of money launder. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had to carry all this cash around yeah. with me for several months around, as I went around the tour. And then ultimately I, that win gave me the confidence to then change my direction a little bit, work on my equipment a little bit more. And then I ultimately won my second world title in Hawaii later that year. And Mike Myers would yes. have no idea. No, the, of course the, not. <laughs> The but impact fat is bastard wouldn't have any idea. <laughs> <laughs> now, so I'm going to have to move you on. So, 20 years before that film, mm. um, Michael End wrote The NeverEnding Story, mm. German author, mm. and uh, mm. you have chosen mm. that as your book. I have. Did you did you read it then or later, or was I it read, read it to then. you? Or you read okay? I read it in the 80s, and it was my favourite book as a child. And and similar to how the book is. Um, I guess it's an escape from reality. It goes from Fantasia to the real world, back to Fantasia to the real world. And it, he didn't write it to educate or, or teach. He wrote it to take us in on a mystical journey into the magical world. Hmm. And, um, you know, the story around this this little chubby kid who's just lost his mum. Bastion, and, is Bastion, it? Bastion, yep. yep. And, and, and being bullied by other kids and runs into this antique bookshop and sees the guy on the phone and reading this amazing looking book and is just so captivated by the cover of the book he's like I've got to have that book and so the guy gets on the phone he steals the book and then that yeah. goes on to the rest of the story and how he becomes a hero yes so uh, I just thought it was a beautiful tale because um, it was even though it wasn't there to educate it did inspire and it took me away you know I think as a kid we have such most of us when we're children uh, well I'm very fortunate as a child I had the freedom to roam and the freedom to imagine the freedom to create and also the freedom to fail and I feel that that's one of the things that's enabled me to become a successful adult or all of those things, actually. Mm. So what I love about this book was just the freedom to imagine. Sure. And, uh, and share in that story with all of those characters and how he can, and we all do this as human beings, you know, we immerse ourselves in something and we become convinced that that's where we're meant to be. And then we doubt it mm -hmm. and then we sabotage it and then someone gives us some, some advice or wisdom and then we re-believe it. And so then we immerse ourselves back in it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we become the hero of our own story. And that's essentially why the book inspired me. How did you get the book? That's a very good question. I think my dad might have bought it for me um, as a birthday present or maybe I saw it when we were out at the shops one day and, and I said, Dad, I've got to have this book. Can I please have this book? Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can, I, can I have this book? And so I was very fortunate my dad bought me the book. And then when my brother, Jason, had his first son, Joshua, I gave it to him as right. his christening present because it was my favourite childhood book. And do you reread it or do you read it to his kids? Or? I do reread it. Oh. Yes, I do love it. It's because I read a lot, like you, you know, you've written, written a book as have I and, and I read a lot of professional development, self-development kind of style of books. It's nice to immerse yourself in, in magical lands and just forget about life for a little while and detach from yourself, detach from your own, your own reality to yeah. immerse yourself in someone else's. So I, I, yeah, I, I think it's a really healthy escape, that book. There's a wonderful, on that point, there's a wonderful story about the writing process of it where the author called up the publisher. So it was supposed to be published in 1977 and he called up and said, I can't get Bastion out of... Fantasia. So he, he's right, he's, he's written him into it <laughs> and he goes, I can't get him out. Really? And he goes, well, it's just a book, mate. He goes, yeah, I know, but, but I'm, I'm the author and I'm in it and I can't get him out. <laughs> so, so was he Bastion? Uh, yeah, well, that's right. I mean, yeah, I, I, as the author, must have been Bastion, I just yeah. can't get him out. So, so <laughs> y the deadline w was pushed back like nine, ten times because you get, you know, where's Bastion now? Yeah. <laughs> well, he's still stuck there. And then eventually he got him out and published the book in, in 79. There Genius. You go. And, I, and I love the fact he's called, his, his name is appropriate for a never ending story. He's called Michael End. But there yes, you go. yeah, I know, yeah. right? Fantasy. You owe him a dollar. So, so that was made into uh, 
three films actually and and many people when i when i was preparing for this many people are asking about never any story they all reference the the film not the book really but your song that you've chosen mm. is potentially best known from a film as well from the wonderful eight mile yes so you you, you chose lose yourself I am uh, which won the the oscar for the best original um song yep and what an awesome film Oh uh, yeah, and, and and to end on the scene, yeah, holy! It's a bit like actually Purple Rain, where, where yes. it, you know it's at the end when the credits are going, yeah. but it sums it up yeah. so amazingly. Mm. And the story of Eminem, him writing that mm. on the set, mm. you know. That, anyway, so, so, but it's not about what I like about the song; no. it's about what you well, like. Hey, about the song. Take to, me there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me why you've uh, what you like about it and why you've chosen it. Well, I love the passion, the honesty, the rawness. Um, it is a biographical. In, you know, creates biographical images when he sings it, and um, essentially it became my anthem to win my sixth and seventh world titles because right. uh, I rarely listened to music before I competed, and just randomly uh, when I was competing for my sixth consecutive world title because um, I wanted to achieve something and no other athlete mm-hmm. or surfer had ever done, male or female. So that's I was really working hard towards that. I just put my headphones in my ears and I press play on my iPod and that was the first song that came on. Right. And so it became my anthem. And I thought, you know, I've got to lose myself in the music and the moment and I own it. I better never let go because I only get one shot. Yeah. And I love at the start, he said, if you had the chance to capture everything you've ever wanted, would you just let it slip? Mm. And I think... There was times, well, I know there was times when I was competing that I did let it slip and I was very fortunate that I was able to capture it and not let it slip. Mm. Uh, Either someone within my dream team brought it to my attention or I brought it to my own attention. So long story short, when I was sitting in the water competing for my sixth world title in the quarterfinals, because this was several days later, I was thinking that it's over because I was being beaten, I was losing, um, I started to believe that, okay, my chances are done, so let's just get over it and, you know, I'll just come back next year. I was giving myself all these excuses and mm-hmm. reasons and stories and it's all self-sabotage, you know, it's just yeah. all a story. And then I sat up and I went, no, I am going to win this. I'm going to get out of my own way. So I used all of the knowledge that I'd uh, drawn upon to motivate myself to win this uh, in the lead up to this particular event. It was the last event of the year on Maui at Honolulu Bay. And then so as I'm reinforcing this positivity in my own mind, all of a sudden I start tuning into the music that they're playing randomly over the loudspeaker and Eminem came on. Amazing. So I'm sitting in there, sitting in the water, you better lose yourself <laughs> in the music the moment you own it. And mm. so then a wave popped up in front of me and mm. it was my opportunity to go. Fortunately, my competitor who had priority missed it and the first wave of the set this particular day was the best wave. I rode it to the best of my ability. I needed a 6.67 I scored an 8.5 and that won me my sixth world title. Wow. So that song has inspired me to become the best of the best. And then once again when I was competing several years later, three years later for my uh, seventh world title, just randomly put my headphones in, press play and then it came on again. It's, it's, it's incredible the the sort of the law of attraction and, yeah. and coincidences, and I, I can't think. I mean, hearing that wonderful story of any more appropriate lyric mm. for what you were going through and what you needed at that moment. True, it's just incredible. Yeah. Reading about you mm-hmm. in preparation for this is you seem uncommonly sort of introspective and thoughtful about stuff. Is that something you've always been? Or you, I, I, I wrote down here when you said you're the compassion of a tiger <laughs> shark. But, whereas I've, I've only known you recently and you're very charming and likeable. And um, But so it seems in a way that you are a different person now than maybe you were whenever. I That's mean, very it, observant of you. Yeah. Yes, I am. I'm a completely different person. Sometimes I reflect on the athlete that I was and can barely compare myself to that person. Mm. I can barely relate to that person. I was very fierce, very driven, very hungry, almost desperate. Mm. And uh, and it was also at a time when there was limited opportunity for female athletes, let yes. alone women surfers. So it was just fight and just you know, may the strongest survive, <laughs> survival mm. of the fittest and the strongest and the most determined. And um, I had this very negative belief that for me to win, I had to either hate my competition or behave in a way that gave them reason to hate me. And so right. that's what drove me yeah. and that's what cost me as well. Sure. It cost me my sense of 
happiness. It cost me my uh, quality of relationships with my competitors and my peers. Mm. It cost me my health and well-being. I had so many severe injuries. I had chronic fatigue twice. I had um, near life-threatening injuries from random mistakes and, and experiences and in very nasty waves. Um, and it cost me my quality of joy as an athlete. Uh, you know, it's, a lot of athletes, they reflect on their competitive years and go, they were the best years of my life. Or I reflect on those years and go, they were the hardest years mm. of my life. Very few athletes have that mentality. And so I am very introspective. I'm very reflective. Yeah. And, uh, and I want to learn. And I want to grow and I want to improve and I want to enhance people's journeys through their lives to make sure they don't have to go through the same shit that I went through. It's, I, it's amazing hearing you talk, Lena. It, for me, there, there's something that happened in in my career, actually, that, that really changed my life, where someone was chatting me through the difference between abundancy theory and paucity theory. So if you want to win... There's one notion, which is, well, if I win, everyone else has got to lose. Mm -hmm. You know, if I move to Australia, I've got to, I've got to say that I hate England. There's, a, there's, a, there's another version, so you're oppositional. Mm -hmm. There's another version, which is the cake's big enough for everyone. You can win. You can be. It's, it's abundancy theory. Is you can be world champion surfer and be nice to everyone and help everyone else as as well. Rather than it's not. So, so if I'm running a company and I want it to be successful, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean. I've got to kill everyone else. No. You go, I'll be successful. And who knows, maybe my success will help other people as well get success. Exactly. You think, wow. Yeah. And what it does, it makes you more likeable, mm. genuinely, but mm. also it means you're not living a life that's that's misaligned. So you know when you're being a dick, yeah. right? And yeah. if you're walking around going, well, I don't really like the person I am. Mm. That's not healthy for your for your soul. But then there's, a, there's so many times where if you're pursuing something of absolute necessity... And I mean, we could go into so many different layers in this one. Mm. But if you're going through something where you absolutely, like your identity, your sense of self-worth is wrapped around mm. it, then I don't give a fuck what anyone thinks. Mm. I have to have that. Mm. And if you're not with me, get the fuck out of my mm. way because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to eat you alive because that is way more important to me than earning your recognition or respect or friendship. I don't care what mm. you say. And I, that's how fierce that I was. I, and that there's something... Um, which which sort of troubles me because mm. I I look at the success that that you have had and, and in a very minor way in some other fields the success that I've had it makes it easier potentially for you and I to then become nicer people mm. because you've scratched that itch right so just pretend you tried as hard as you could to be a uh, successful surfer yeah. and you came third <laughs> in six world championships so you never were the world champion yeah. then it's an even bigger thing yes. and some of the people that you talk to who you inspire mm. let's be honest they're not going to be world champions no. at anything yeah. and, and so I think it's a really really noble endeavour to help people uh, who aren't going to be the super achievers mm. so, so there's one, one thing you, you could be incredibly useful to you know, train a protege who wants to be a world surfing champion, obviously, but it's the other work you do that mm. I think is is more noble because because not everyone is going to be and a world surfer. So that's the work that I more enjoy. Yeah. But just going back to your point around the two different theories around scarcity and then having abundance, mm. if you have this fundamental belief that success has to be hard and it's a subconscious belief, then you will make it so. Yes. Uh, and f you can't change what you can't see. So sometimes you need to bring these things to the surface. Yeah. And that just means taking a stock take, like stopping and asking yourself, am I happy with the person I am and, and with the, the gravitational pull mm. or push that I have? Yeah. You know, and have I got the right people around me? You know, sometimes you just got to ask yourself, am I producing the results that I want? Yeah. If not, what's stopping me? And I had this fundamental belief that success had to be hard yeah. and that came from a lot from my experiences as a child. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've got plenty of explanations, but that doesn't mean I have to live by that. No. I can choose to change it. So now, after winning six consecutive world titles in a state of fear and a seventh world title in a state of love, yes. I know that you can succeed in two different yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah, You and I both have the luxury of having had success before changing our perspectives yeah. on that. The thing is, is that it's still easy for me to just fall back into what I refer to as my survival mode. Right. Which is six is the six world titles, one to six. Yeah. That's survival mode. Yeah. That's when it's fear. That's when it's striving, struggling, mm. holding on, clawing in, yep. trying, guessing, hoping, thinking. Mm. <laughs> it's hard just saying those words. Yeah. When I need to break out of that, which is very quickly because <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. it's not sustainable. You've got to look at how you're going about achieving success and if it's not sustainable, then you have to change it. Yep. And 
I know that I can win in a state of love. My yeah. seventh world title proved that to me. Sure. If I can't seek evidence of that in my own life, then I seek evidence of that in someone else. Yeah. And my number one inspiration in that state is Stephanie Gilmore. Right. Because she is very successful and does take people along on the right. Yeah. Wonderful. Right? She makes success look easy, even though I know it's not. Yeah. But she makes it look like fun. She mm. exudes joy when she paddles into waves. She's paddling around with this state of gratitude. She's just really enjoyable to watch. And I'm like, so she proves to me that success can be, yeah. it can be achieved in a state of grace and effortlessness. This is the five of my life. More with Lane after the break. This is the five of my life with Nigel Marsh. It, it's a real privilege to hear you talk like this. So there's something else um, I got quite powerfully from you that I found surprising in, in reading your book and researching you is... And, and forgive me for saying this, but it appears that you are uh, susceptible to sort of like, like cripplingly, crippling self-doubt mm. when all the evidence would be pointing to the reverse. So, so it's one thing if you go, well, actually, I'm an alcoholic, uh, and my life is a disaster, I've never done anything, I've never had a job, la 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 You go, okay, you might think, which I, I think we're all God's children and everyone's worthwhile, but you might think with that data set, yeah. I'm not very worthy. You go, well, I'm the world champion, for fuck's sake. I've done yeah. it seven times, what do you want? <laughs> and yet you still seem to get hit with the black cloud of, I, I'm not very worthy. Yeah, I'm not enough. And that well, comes- stop it. <laughs> <laughs> right, I commit to that right now, <laughs> that I am enough. Yeah. <laughs> and I can walk into, you know, quite honestly, if I'm ever having a self-pity party for one, I just walk into my trophy room, <laughs> have a look around and go, yeah, I've done all right. Yeah. <laughs> I've got nothing to complain about. But, 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 do, but do you, is, is that true? You, you, do- you know what? I only go into those moments where I'm fatigued. Right. Okay, interesting. Yeah, if I've worn myself out, then I start to doubt. Yeah. So then I have to question, well... Have I pushed too hard or am I really believing this? Yeah. <laughs> and then I just have to look in my own eyes in the mirror and look at the colour of them and go, okay, yeah, I'm exhausted. Right. You need to take a day off or you just need to lighten up, stop stop weighing in with commentary that's not serving you, Yeah. create a whole new mantra, set a new set of beliefs and uh, lighten up on yourself. Have some wow. fun. Get go out, surfing. Get out your own way, as you yeah, said Yeah, get earlier. out of my own way and go surfing. <laughs> so we have to get on. This is the five of my life. We have to get on to your, <laughs> your fourth choice. Now, now, most people, when I ask them to choose a place, choose a specific geographical place, but you've gone next level. And you, <laughs> Are you, you surprised? Just follow a brief woman. Are you surprised? You, you've gone the ocean. <laughs> yes. So tell me about that. The ocean is my place of solace. It's the one place in the whole universe where I feel f- a sense of freedom. I feel truly relaxed and the most burning desire in every human being, I feel a sense of belonging. I don't feel like I belong anywhere else other than in the ocean. And, and is it equally good whether it's Fistral Beach or Manly Beach. As long as it's salt. As long as it's salt. Okay, interesting. How wonderful, because there is a lot of it on this planet. (laughs) Very fortunate. You can access it. (laughs) And it's warming up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And and, and so have you ever lived Mm. away from it? No, I have not, ever. If anything, I've just committed my life to living as close to it as I possibly can. And one of the best pieces of advice I received when I started earning decent money was invest in real estate that you could ultimately live in yourself. Mm -hmm. So every piece of real estate I ever bought had ocean views. Right, okay. (laughs) Um, And then... I went to London for the Olympic Games in 2012 as an la- athlete liaison officer for the Australian Olympic team yeah. and spent six or seven weeks around London and I immersed myself into the Olympic Games. I had an access hilarious pass as if I'm not going to abuse them yeah, out of yeah, that. Yeah. So I did. And I had an absolute ball, but once again, immersing myself and giving too much of myself, I left there completely exhausted. My sister was working in London at the time, so I grabbed her and she and I went to Barcelona for a holiday. Mm-hmm. And the minute I got there, I dove in the ocean and I cried ah. because I, I didn't realise how much I'd missed, missed it, right. being, f- feeling like I'm nurtured. Sure. I feel so, I feel like I go back into the womb. Right. Like it's my embryonic fluid when I'm in the ocean. I feel that sense of joy and freedom and happiness and centeredness and connectedness and just, oh, <laughs> that's how I feel every time I'm in the water. Do you fear for it? Do I fear for it? Fear for the ocean. I do fear for the ocean. Well, I fear for our lives because we will not survive without the survival of our oceans mm. and our coral. You know, I, I, that produces our mm. oxygen. It's the plankton that produces our oxygen. So, yeah, I fear for the ocean. 
I saw a film recently which I wish I hadn't, and it was, was about plastic in the ocean. Which one was that? Uh, I forget what it's called. It's a documentary, and yeah. the thing that that stuck with me, which I, I can't get it out of my head, is uh, my amateur thinking is okay. There's all this crap in the ocean where we can scoop it out one day, right? <laughs> one day. W- w- what the film showed was that the plastic breaks down into micro beads yeah. so it's like a soupy mess in yeah. which you can't so it's not like i think oh okay, well, i'll go and pick the plastic bag up no 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 nah. it's broken down it will be there for 600 years at least and you go oh my word yeah we're suffocating our planet yeah yeah just through plastic my own dentist didn't realize there was microplastics in toothpaste All right he's like why do you use herbal toothpaste because like, there's no microplastics in them he's like what's for microplastic Oh, God, here we go. <laughs> so I've, I've, got, I've got a confession for you. So, yes. so I do something, my, my children laugh at me. I, I actually make them do it as well, so they avoid me. It, it's, it's a thing called Take Three. I'll take three for the sea. I, I do it every day. I love it. Oh, it's good so on you. easy. Uh, and, and, and do you know what? I get a real. And if I. If Why I've are only, your children laughing? It, well, because dad's a saddo. So it, he, even if, if I can only get two, mm. I go looking for the third. <laughs> I go, where are you going? I go, hold on, I haven't got my third. Uh, the, bit thing, of plastic. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that when you're walking along the beaches on the northern beaches, that it's not that hard to find right. three. I actually commit myself to finding a dozen. Right. I, I, I literally commit myself to picking up everything I walk past because right. what you walk past, you allow. You set the standards by your own behaviour. Do, do you know Little Marley Beach in the National Park? Mm. So I went this beautiful place mm. and I was really upset because it's the most beautiful place. You've got to walk there. Yeah. And, uh, and then there's all the shit on the beach. Yeah, it's I was, so I, I wish I'd brought a bin liner. Yeah. So I'm putting other people's... <laughs> in your plastic. In pa- yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when I find plastic in the water and I'm in a bikini, I can't hold it. So I paddle up to a mate with broad right. shorts and ask yeah. him if he's got a pocket and just oh. put but but here we go. I'm a long range optimist. Yes, we're going to sort too. this shit out. We we're going to sort, sort it out somehow. Out. But you know what? It's not just the plastic that we've got a concern no. with. It's <laughs> all of our behaviours, and we're just we're too apathetic. We're just waiting for someone else to do it because we don't think we can make any difference. But every one of us can make a difference by just choosing to not buy single use plastics, reject the use of straws. The number one, I think, the number one culprit for marine and beach pollution in when it regards to plastic are those little sushi fish caps. Mm. Those little red caps. I pick up one every single day. And just making different choices and thinking ahead. And Mm. that's all it takes. And people think it, you know, it has to change the world to be important. But actually just by changing your thought patterns and changing your choices changes the world. And then it does make it I'm so glad you do. I'm going to no longer feel embarrassed about it. I'm going to proudly do take three. Tell your kids, Lane does it. And if they don't, then... That's it. Okay, I'm so I'm going to come around and belt them. (laughs) On to your last choice. (laughs) Yes. Now, now your last choice has has little or or any monetary value, but I imagine enormous emotional value. You've chosen your personal diary Mm -hmm. from 2002 and 2003. Yes. Tell me about that. So I was looking through my trophy room wondering what thing do I, what possession do I treasure the most? Now I've got my baby bracelet and I've got world title trophies and I've got gold medals from Blasters Games and I've got actually one of the most amazing plaques I have is a photo of me with autographs of congratulations from all of the world champions before me Mm. congratulating me. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I better take that off the wall if anything happens here. But I started looking through all the different books that I had and I found my diary and I started reading through it and I went, oh, wow, there's some pretty monumental entries in this diary. Just from the moment that I met Kirk, when I was set up with Kirk. Is that, is that in 2002? 2002. Sure. Actually, the, the diary starts even before that when I broke up with my previous partner, Ken, mm-hmm. and uh, I was with him for five years and we right. broke up in 2002 and I met Kirk quite soon after that right. and I was set up by John Stevens from Noiseworks and right. Front Man of In Excess. And then so just the entries that I have about how much I love him mm. and how much I'm grateful for having him in my life. And, yeah. then, and just the, the, the thoughts of, of marriage and things like that in the first three or four months. And I had never experienced that level of, of commitment or unconditional love mm. in my life. And so I was, when I read it, I was even astonished sure. <laughs> at the, the absolute love that I had for him for such, at such a quick Mm. You know, in such a quick time, space of time. Yeah. So, yeah, it fascinated me. And then I went on to win my fifth world title and what that meant to me. Yeah. And then in 2003, 
uh, just the the changes. And I actually declared my love for Kirk on national television on the Andrew Denton show. Ballsy move. Very ballsy. And had you had you agreed you were going to do that, or you just no. went, oh my god, she's gone, <laughs> Troppo. <laughs> <laughs> the girls lost it. <laughs> my competitors probably thought, oh, good, Lane's weak. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it strengthened my resolve. Yeah. Um, and there's some of the challenges that I endured throughout that year yep. and then losing my mojo and going back into a really depressed state and then how I was able to overcome that and some of the conversations that I've had with people and some of the really dark, distressing thoughts mm. that I had that I wrote in my journal and then some of the thoughts that actually lifted me up and got me out of that space. So it's a really beautiful reflection of some of the things that I went through, some of the challenges that I overcame because, you know, I talk about the fact that, you know, we all – we achieve something and no one sees the shit that we go through. Mm. A lot of us actually just put that out of our own minds. We don't even recognize the shit we go through. So yeah, it was a really uh, valuable little item that I found. I went, wow, this is awesome. (laughs) And and you've been keeping a diary since you were 12, is that right? And and do you... Actually, maybe even younger. Do you keep them all? Yeah, I've kept them all. And do you ever reread them? Yes, when I write my book. Do you find yourself squeezing your buttocks in embarrassment or Um, do you... Well, only when I read some of the... Um, things that I've written in there knowing that my author had read them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I freely handed my diary yes. to him thinking, This is oh, Michael. Yeah, Michael yeah. Gordon, yeah. who I, I'm so deep, deeply just disappointed that we've lost him too early. Mm. But um, I was so grateful that I had the opportunity to write my book with Michael Gordon. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I freely handed over my diaries and went, here you go. Yeah. And then I'm reading about some of the th- even sexual encounters. Yeah, and I yeah, just yeah. read that and went, oh, my God, how did Michael look me in the face the next day after yeah. reading that stuff? Sure. <laughs> just some of that kind of thing. But, um, yes, I've been keeping diaries, and I remember I used to write in calendars. I was a massive fan of Garfield as a kid. Right. I had lots of Garfield calendars, and I remember just writing, like squeezing as much as I could into a square to, yeah. to write about my day, and a lot of it was mm. unreal and stuff. And I remember my nan, or she was, I called her my nan, but she was like our nanny who came and looked after me after my mum died when I was six. And she obviously had started reading them because she'd leave post it notes saying, Stop writing unreal. I'm like, Why are you reading my diary? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, listen, so you are, you're an angel to come in and talk so uh, authentically and unguardedly. I'm really. Thank you grateful um the, the the last trick question is who do you want to listen to next on five of my life we, we've got an amazing contact list here they, they can't be dead and they can't be fictional okay. so who would you like uh, <laughs> uh, me to call next to get on the show what about pink consider it done brilliant <laughs> she's got the time five <laughs> of my life with nigel marsh bring I it up i love it lane beachley thank you so much for being on five of my life thanks for thank having you. me The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. 